marking system on one of the beams for 666. I, just, I wasn't even aware of that. Stuff. And I was taking this as a serious solution to a potentially problem that, a problem that would not go away. And it was interesting, we met in this room, and because of the tight meetings we were involved with, certain people would not introduce them, give you their full name or where they came from. I just had to trust that my two contacts had contacted the right parties to be there at the right time, and that they would all be responsible individuals. There was a mistake. After that meeting, I discovered that two of the people in the meeting had never been asked this, yet they knew about the meeting, they knew what it was about. They knew who was going to be there. And later research indicated that one of them actually worked with the Department of Agriculture and one of them worked with the Department of the Treasury. What prompted our looking at these two was the way they asked the questions, the questions they asked, the attitude behind them, even the body language, indicated that they had reasons for the use of this technology other than the one that was intended at the meeting. In fact, their largest concern was how fast could we make a couple billion of them? And could we each get each one of those a unique identity number? Now, this particular pill shaped device, very minute, had a lot of flexibility in its capabilities. Yet, it was basically just a, almost a transponder. You would send a frequency to it and it would respond back with its unique number, which not, could not be changed once the chip was made. Yet there were a lot of capabilities that could be added to this chip, such as monitoring temperature, blood pressure, pulse, and even waveforms out of the brain. And, but that was for research down the road. What was amusing to me a few months ago on a website uh, that uh, likes to cre uh, collect articles on the unusual is that a lady out east had a chip removed from her body in uh, 1999. And they had it blown up on the website. And it was a slight modification of this chip from them with some of this enhancement. And it was put in her as she believed in either 1980 or 1981. What was amusing about this was that this gentleman never had to worry about money again, and he quietly passed on a lot of this technology to somebody we never knew. And this concerned my contacts in Washington, because it never went anywhere with them. Somebody else took it and ran with it, and we never knew who it was. Now, in 1984, I found another technology by just snipping the web sniffing the, the, the literature of our industry and a dozen other industries. And I found that there was a professor at the University of New South Wales, who, where I still have the files on, that had discovered a way to make a microscopic lithium niobate chip. And by accident, he had scratched it. And he had a uh, RF transmitter there. And he had a receiver on by sheer chance. And he found that um, the... Uh, certain frequency, he could send an energy beam to the chip, and it would respond back with a number. He worked on that technology, and that technology, eventually, I found out about. We flew him in to Denver to our company, System Group of Colorado, and we did a test. He had some primitive small chips he brought with him. They are totally passive and very small, 30 seconds of an inch, and then only a couple thousand thick. And by etching them, you could again create a unique signature in each one. And this one theoretically could, depending on the size of it and the size of the etching, could have a unique number in the billions and billions. And in fact, the test we did was amusing in that we <coughs> set up a transmitter and a receiver based on removing a air drill from our drop ceiling and plugging up our transceiver into that as our antenna. And we were able to read that thing glued to a little piece of, spy, of, of cardboard from 100 feet away with a piece of grill out of the drop ceiling, which is a, a pretty primitive antenna. Because we didn't know what frequency we were dealing with, so we had to come up with some kind of generic we were so impressed with the 
capabilities of that would read through thin layers of material, like thin plywood. And we were so impressed that again I felt that this was a technology that was really good some value. Because we also discovered in some testing with papers the papers work he had with us, that if we had a microscopic coil antenna with this, so we could read this from a mile away. And his later on analysis, a few weeks later, he got back to me and said that if we had an antenna, a coil antenna two inches in diameter with a chip in the middle, and the antenna's actually doing that, it's an amplifier that we put in And that what was sent back out is harmonic of the original frequency. That his numbers currently show that he could read this amplifier. Again, I took this and a lot more care of this to a meeting we had in Virginia at a subcontractor's company that I knew that does a lot of work in the This time I had the director of the of security for all of State Department there. And again, a good friend from CIA. Again, we had, at the last minute, people walk in the door with the right credentials, but we didn't know who they were. It turns out, again, we had people, two this time again, who we, after the meeting, we realized shouldn't have been there. And yet they had credentials that were awesome. Because it turns out afterwards, I found out they had never been called by my credentials. Yet they knew about our home. They knew of exactly what time, what place, and what we were going to be talking about. And supposedly, my phone calls were made over secure phone lines. What concerned me more about this particular event was that I have in my records again the name of, at the time of the head of security of State Department. And I got to know him well because I designed the security system, at least a major portion of it, for Main State, for the headquarters and Foggy Bottom in DC. And so he and I knew each other very well. And that one of the things that Bob wanted to do was before he retired, he wanted to have his family, particularly his two boys in this school, experience what it was like to live off out of the country. So he actually gave himself a job. He demoted himself to head of security for East Africa. And he, they, he and his family, shortly after this event, this meeting, moved to Kenya. 